Hi, I think we're broadcasting. Welcome like we to. Are. Okay, great. Welcome to our webinar today. It's going to go about an hour, though Bruce has kindly uh, offered to stay a little longer because sometimes these conversations go a little longer. Um, and I might as well, and maybe David will as well. But functionally, it's an hour long. I'm Jonathan Orpin. I'm the founder and president of two companies, New Energy Works, which is a design build firm specializing in timber framing and high performance, and Pioneer Millworks. Pioneer Millworks reclaims uh, wood products and uh, works, makes wood products into uh, uh, whatever is needed. Uh, we're about 130 people. We're employee owned. We're about 30 or 40 years uh, old. I can't remember that far back. I say I've been in this company since before dirt was invented. It's been a long time. But let me introduce you to my great two uh, co-presenters. Bruce, uh, Bruce King, I met vicariously by looking at the, by being at a uh, web, uh, actually a seminar when they were really in person out in New England and listening to some compatriots of his, Chris Madwood and, um, and Ace and Jacob from New Frameworks were giving a presentation on something that I hadn't really thought about, intuitively understood it, but in high performance work, we always think about that 50 year return on investment, that how long is this building gonna last and, and how much energy are we saving? They completely turned my world over upside down when they said, who gives a shit about 50 years ago right now? What we need to be concentrating on is the carbon in the atmosphere right now, the 400 plus parts per million that we need to be focused on. We need to be thinking about what to do now. And that's what today is about a little bit as well as whatever else you want it to be about. We also, uh, they also talked about this guy, Bruce King, who wrote or edited and partly wrote a book called The New Carbon Architecture. And they said he was out in San Francisco because I live in Portland. I said, well, there's my homeboy. I need to meet this guy. So when I got back to Portland from New England, I immediately looked him up, convinced him to do a keynote at the Timber Framers Guild up in Timberline Lodge that year and knew I had a best friend forever. This guy was so strong, a speaker and a person. And I knew my hunches were right because my wife drove him to the airport after the talk. And afterwards she said, this guy has debt. And that's all I need to know. When my wife says, this guy has debt, I know I got the right guy. So Bruce King, author of New Carbon Architecture, will talk first. And then we'll follow up with David Arkin, who I've just met recently. Love his work, Arkin Tilt Architects in Berkeley, California, and, uh, and works all over the Pacific Northwest and maybe more, I'm not really sure. He's, a, he's focused on sequestering carbon in low carbon and, and he'll talk about some of his work as well. So about 15 or so minutes of each one of them and then we'll go into a question and answer um, and go from there. So Bruce, do you wanna take it off? Sure. I should, uh, while well, I try to get this organized, can you all see my slides? I can. You can? Yes. Okay. Um, David and I go back. Uh, we present together a lot these days, but it all started almost 30 years ago, 28 years ago, when we were hired to work on our first straw bale project, the Real Good Solar Living Center in Hopland, California, which is still one of the coolest green projects in, in every sense of the word that I've worked on. Uh, we're happy and proud about it. And uh, it started a long friendship and professional collaboration that uh, you're seeing the continuation of today. So, um, Jonathan, that was it. thank you for that setup. That was really well said. You basically gave my talk for me, uh, so maybe I should just shut up. But I'll show you a few slides anyway, um, just because there's a cool one about concrete, and everybody loves concrete. This is how much atmosphere we have to work with. If you scraped off that paper thin layer that surrounds the globe of the Earth, that is what we're breathing in this moment right now, it would only be that big. That's why it's really not hard for us to muck it up. 
and hopefully it won't be that hard for us to repair it. And that's what we're basically talking about here is climate repair. For the half million years or so that human beings have been evolving from our cousin primates on Earth, atmospheric CO2 was banging around between two and 300 parts per million. And of course, just very recently, in the last few decades really of the Industrial Revolution, we've shot past 400 parts per million. And here's the thing, even if we stopped tomorrow, cold stop burning all fossil fuels tomorrow, they'd still even be going up. They wouldn't even hold steady. It would keep going up because of the methane coming out of the Arctic, the reduced albedo at the poles, and all the stuff leaking out of the infrastructure that we built up for our oil-based economy. We have to get it out of the air. We have to draw it down. And here, for those of you who haven't seen Paul Hawkins' book, Drawdown, I urge you to get it and read it. It's about the 100 easiest solutions available to us right now for getting the carbon out of the air and putting it someplace safe. Well, right now the ocean's doing that job by default. The oceans absorb CO2 as it builds up in the atmosphere, which might seem like a good thing, but it's not. Uh, it lowers the pH of the oceans. It's called acidification and it's disastrous for corals and other marine life. So that's not working out so well. Probably the next biggest and best repository is soil. And I'm sure a lot of you listening are aware that there's a lot of people doing a lot of great work on regenerative agriculture and forestry and all sorts of things with the way we work with the plants and soil around us. And carbon farming is a rapidly growing science. But we work with buildings and buildings are a big repository too, or they can be. The built environment is the biggest by far user of physical stuff. It's the biggest, it's the biggest stuff we build. We human beings are always building stuff with everything all over the place. And in fact, right now we're building so much that we're basically creating another New York City, all five boroughs every month right now. That's going on all the time. That's how much we're building. That might not seem real to you in the Pacific Northwest or in North America because it isn't happening here. I took this picture in Cairo a year ago when I was there. And in a way it's not even um, doing it justice because you can see a bit of green there, which was really anomalous. It was um, a huge expanse of hundreds of square miles of concrete and some fired brick, not a shred of insulation anywhere, not a whole lot of greenery anywhere. It was jaw dropping. And I think Cairo is somewhat typical of the new mega cities appearing all over the world, including, and especially in the Southern hemisphere that don't have the resources that we have, but they have a lot of people. So some basics that again, probably a lot of you know, buildings account for about 40% of global emissions. That seems to be fairly well known. A quarter of that or 10% we attribute to the embodied carbon or the materials that we build with. Probably more than 10%, but that's a conservative number. But that's effectively much more the effect of that 10% is much larger. And I'll show you here why, what we mean by the time value of carbon. Start with history. The green building mo movement of the past 30 years, 40 years has figured out that every building project has two phases. The first one, you build it. Those are the embodied emissions of the materials and the trucks roaring around and all of that. And everybody occupies it. And the operating emissions over the 60 or 80 hundred years of that building's lifetime dwarf the embodied emissions. And so that's what we focused on in green building is reducing the operating emissions and getting them down towards or even to zero, the net zero building, the passive house. Good for us. I mean, it's great. It's a lot of great progress. So far, so good, right? Except that suddenly something else came into focus that we're not that interested in 60, 80, 100 years. We're in climate emergency and we're very much concerned about the next 10 or 20 years where we really have to turn on a dime and change things around. That 10% actually becomes a lot more because it's not just the amount of carbon emitted, but when it's in the air. You add that bedroom to your house, you build that high rise downtown Portland, you build the new hospital in your community. Before anybody's ever walked in and started using it, there's a whole lot of emissions that are up in the air cooking away. And it's the area to the right of that line that is the effect on the climate not just the height of the line. You boil all that down and our, our colleagues at Architecture 2030 worked out that for most building topologies, the kind of stuff that probably you and I work on, 
about three fourths of your climate impact is going to be from the embodied emissions, the materials you chose for your project. It dwarfs the operating emissions. So our message to you is, and here's your takeaway, absorb more carbon than you admit, emit with your project. And we hope to tell you how at least to get down to zero, if not to do better than that and have carbon absorbing buildings that behave like forests. Imagine cities that are like forests and just absorbing carbon rather than cooking it up into the air. Well, for all the time I've been in green building, this was our understanding. We got to make really cool new buildings that are net zero and are really clean and don't have bad chemicals. And that's all very nice. And oh yeah, we should reduce the embodied emissions. And oh yeah, we should upgrade existing buildings because that matters too, yes. Except that that's backwards. It's actually the reverse. As far as the climate is concerned, the most important thing we can do is upgrade the buildings we've got in Portland, in Cairo and everywhere in between and reduce the embodied emissions because there's a lot more action there than there is in the operating for the next two decades. And then if we're gonna still build new buildings, build them really well. Here's an example. Um, I didn't know what kind of, like, I, I don't know what to, how to tell anybody what they should do. I don't know what to tell you to do. I don't know you. I don't know hardly any of you. I can't see you We're on a Zoom call, sorry. But here's a typical example, a really good topology that we see in cities all over North America, and I think in Europe too, for urban infill and for pe people are gonna live in a city, which in many ways is what we wanna be doing. Podium building, you dig out the ground a little bit, you build a garage, you pour a post-tension concrete slab on that and then frame five stories of apartments or condos above that. You probably see them going up in Portland. This one's in um, Berkeley, but they're all over the place. And it's a great way to efficiently build space that doesn't shadow the sidewalk all day long and do all sorts of things that some urban buildings do that we don't like. Use low carbon concrete, and I'm gonna say more in a minute about how you do that. Use cellulose insulation instead of plastic foam insulation. And David's gonna tell you more about that in a minute. And use FSE certified wood. Forest Stewardship Council is the gold standard for protecting forests if you're going to be using wood. There's another one, um, SFI, Sustainable Forestry Initiative, which is basically industry sponsored. And um, maybe it's too harsh to say it's the fox guarding the hen house, but it's certainly not as rigid or as uh, strong a standard as FSC and um, still allows, for example, clear cutting which burns a lot more carbon than if you can manage a forest and leave some trees standing and protect the soil of the forest. Concrete, well, 8% of global emissions come just from concrete. And uh, some people know that, but um, I started looking into it a little bit more. I'm, I'm writing more about this right now. Chris Magwood, whom Jonathan mentioned, he and I are at work right now on a book, Beyond Zero, to follow up on the new carbon architecture and write about um, buildings that absorb carbon, what we're talking about today. And I'm writing the chapter on concrete. I said, well, let's look at this. How, you know, sometimes you want to make a number sort of real, right? So I'm sure all of you have wondered how big is a ton of concrete? If I made a cube of concrete that weighed a ton, it would be almost exactly desk height, 29 inches. But if you see these big numbers, we all see big numbers all the time. You can't kind of can't relate to it. I saw this 20 times. And every time just sort of thought, huh, that's a big number, 10 billion tons of concrete. That's how much the world produces every year. How big is 10 billion tons of concrete? Well, I did the math and then I had to do it again and then try different ways to do it because I couldn't believe the answer I got. Compared to the Eiffel Tower, it looks like that. A cube of concrete that weighs 10 billion tons is a mile on a side. And the world is producing that every year. Mostly it's sand and gravel. 30, 35% of it is Portland cement, the stuff with the big carbon footprint, that 8% of global warming emissions, because you make Portland cement by baking limestone at 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit. And the combination of the chemical reaction and the fuel you burned puts a whole lot of CO2 in the air. How could we improve on that? How can we make low carbon concrete? The most common way right now is to use uh, supplementary cementitious materials, SCMs. Uh, the most commonly available ones being byproducts of industry, fly ash from coal burning power plants and uh, slag from steel plants. I don't see a clock in here, by the way, so I don't know how I'm doing for time, but 
Um, but those are both diminishing, fortunately, because we're burning less coal, we're shutting down coal plants all the time, all over the place. And even in China, where they make so much concrete, they don't have enough fly ash and slag and all of these things. Nonetheless, they're the best interim solution for reducing the footprint of concrete is use less cement and use more of these things. And they actually give you better concrete. The next big one is don't be moonstruck, which is to say, we engineers commonly specify compressive strength at 28 days. Long-standing tradition because we understood that concrete got most of its strength in a month, so that became the benchmark, and nobody thinks too much about it. If you give concrete even just one more month to get the strength that you might need, you can remove a whole hundred pounds of cement out of your typical yard of concrete. It can make a huge difference if you just give it a little more time. And a lot of the concrete that we pour doesn't need its strength right away. Typically foundations, for example, all sorts of things. They don't, they don't need to be strong right away, so don't force them to. Give them time. Use blended cements, meaning you make Portland cement and then you blend it with other things that augment it or help it work well without all the carbon footprint. Ground up limestone and ground up kaolinite clay. Kaolinite clay, if you burn it at a relatively modest temperature, makes a great augmentation for cement. I'm rushing through this, by the way. This could be a 10 hour talk if I really unpacked all these things, so sorry. Read the book when it comes out. You can inject carbon. There's carbonate aggregate. People are taking the emissions from power plants and cement plants and rolling them around in a grain of sand like a uh, oyster does and turning them into chunks of limestone and making artificial gravel, limestone gravel, and therefore absorbing the carbon and putting it into your concrete. They're not on the market quite yet. Carbonate in the UK, Blue Planet in North America. You can augment the strength by injecting liquid CO2 into the ready mix. And uh, Carbon Cure is making big inroads all over North America. They're setting up at plants all over the place and they can improve four or 5% your, your footprint just by injecting the carbon dioxide into the mix, which means it's much stronger, which means you don't need as much cement. Solidia is a very similar technology, um, also available right now. Reduce waste, you can use re reclaimed concrete as aggregate, not as simple as it sounds, but we're getting better and better at it and finding better ways to do that. Ready mix producers already know that they often get a truck coming back that's still one quarter full and they have to figure out what to do with that mix coming back. Typically they just make big chunks that, that then give away for landscape work, but not so effective. We gotta be more clever with that. Probably the biggest thing is to work with the structural engineering community. Um, which is not an easy thing to do. I know for sure, because I try to all the time and it's not easy. We, uh, we're very risk averse. We don't change easily. I was trained all my career to um, just throw in some extra cement and tell them to put in a minimum amount of cement and tell them to do a bunch of things that it turns out I didn't need to tell them to do. And in fact, the American Concrete Institute is now writing memos to the Structural Engineering Association saying, don't do this stuff. Don't specify minimum cement. Don't specify water content. Don't tell the concrete guys how to make concrete. They know how to make concrete. When you do that, you're probably adding cost to your project that your customer doesn't need to pay. And you're probably adding emissions into the climate that didn't need to be there. So we're trying to get structural engineers to have a more loose grip on the steering wheel. More generally, just communicate. Our industry is famous for being so compartmentalized that nobody's talking to each other. I show this picture of the California Public Utilities Commission building in San Francisco because our friend, the engineer, David Marr, was designing this thing and he started thinking about it and he ended up making a few phone calls of the sort that don't usually get made during design, but he brought into a room, the general contractor and the concrete supplier and I think a few of the subs and they all sat around talking. What if we did this? What if we do that? Oh yeah, you can't do that. Oh yeah, you can do that, blah, blah, blah. Next thing you know, they had a building that cost less and he'd reduced the floor to floor height so much that the client actually got an entire another floor in within the height limit that they were constrained to. Communication, who knew, right? Try it. So uh, here in Marin, we tried something. One way to reduce the carbon in concrete is to make it the law. So we changed the building code to reduce the carbon in concrete. That's a very long story, but we succeeded and we got it and it's in place now here in Marin. I talked to our building official just yesterday and he said, it's just too hard to say right now because of COVID. It went into law right before COVID descended on us. So 
hard to say how that's going, but it is being emulated now. New York City, New York State, uh, I think Boulder, Colorado, a lot of places are considering or enacting provisions at a, at a local and state and national scale. This is a movement that's coming into the concrete industry, which the concrete industry knows and is working with us on. I show this picture of the New Bay Bridge in San Francisco because uh, Caltrans, who built it, used low carbon concrete mixes with a lot of slag and fly ash, not to be nice to the client, uh, car climate, but because it's better concrete that's more resistant to saltwater intrusion. Anything you want to read about that, just go to marincounty.org. If you just remember Marin County and Google Marin County and low carbon concrete, you'll find a whole lot of stuff. It's all there. This is the book. Buy the book, buy 10 of them, give them to your friends. Over to you, David. Excellent. Well, before we go to David, so just, just one second before we go to David, for the people who have just come in, um, Bruce is the author of that book and is a, and writing another book, The New Carbon Architecture. Um, David Arkin is with Arkin Tilt Architects uh, out, of, um, out of Berkeley, California. And there is a question, it is, are there other ways other than materials to lower the carbon uh, uh, footprint and the carbon usage? Wow, what a perfect segue into David's work. Um, <laughs> but along with that also, we're talking about build smaller. Oh, wow. I used to say I would browbeat my clients into building smaller. And one, and one smarter person than I said, you may want to try the word inspire them to build smaller. So, and I like that better. And so, you know, there are other ways to do it. Certainly Bruce started off with talking about how it's so important to use what we've got now. Um, I'm terribly guilty, I build new. And um, every once in a while I think, ah, I should really go into deep energy retrofits and it's you know not what our company does, but maybe it's what we ought to do. Maybe Bruce will inspire us to do that. So one of the things we wanted to do with this seminar is to try to give specific tools, not just concepts and not just crazy out, out there stories of what to do. And that's hard to do. There's work you have to do, but Bruce's book and some of David's comments and afterwards, after David's done, we'll actually touch on a few more things and maybe answer a few more questions. So David, the outstanding question is, is materials the only thing? Uh, it's a big thing, but maybe you'll also hit on that while you're talking and take it away. Sure, you bet. And uh, thank you, Bruce, for that perfect uh, introduction of why all of this is important. Um, I will get into some of the specifics that Jonathan mentioned, but certainly making a building that is no smaller, um, no bigger than it needs to be is, is one method of reducing that upfront uh, carbon footprint that a project has. Um, so we'll talk about some of the specific um, ways that we can do that. Um, I'm a partner in Arkin Tilt Architects. My wife, Annie Tilt, did her thesis on the use of wood as if it was a beautiful material, because it is a beautiful material and one that we are very fond of and like to show off in many ways. Um, but we're, it's one of many uh, photosynthetic carbon storing materials that are available to us, um, in some cases commercially, in other cases, you've got to do a little bit of scrounging to come up with them, but um, many options that I look forward to sharing here today. Uh, Architecture 2030 is an organization uh, Bruce made mention of that has done a lot of pioneering work in targeting um, net zero carbon buildings by the year 2050 and um, I'm sorry, by 2030 and a path to uh, a completely carbon neutral society by 2050. One of their tools uh, and products is the Carbon Smart Materials Palette, which uh, the Carbon Leadership Forum's uh, Embodied Carbon Network has contributed to and I invite you to take a look there for um, some resources and metrics on these materials. Very simply, um, we wish we had a magical machine that could somehow pull carbon out of the atmosphere and store it away. And in this you know, beautiful God-given earth, we do, it's called plants. And through photosynthesis, they harvest carbon dioxide, release the oxygen, and that carbon is stored in the 
plants themselves. Some of it goes into the soil, the rest of it is in the stalk, whether it's a tree trunk or a blade of straw or other grasses, and we can take all of that material and build our buildings with it. In fact, there's enough grain straw grown that if we um, stored all of that carbon, we would offset global transportation emissions. The uh, potential impact of these is real, and there are a lot of them that are out there. Some of these you're gonna be familiar with already, others not so much so. Um, by and large, all of them tend to be healthy and safer as well. So if there's any one message I want you to take away today, it's a paraphrasing of Michael Pollan's food rules, which is to build shelter, not too big, mostly plants. So let's start out with some of the ways that we can build with plants. Um, insulation in our structures is probably the biggest opportunity uh, where these materials are best suited. Um, Harkening back to the Carbon Smart Materials palette, uh, they've done a study of insulation and you can see that some of these have an emitted carbon footprint while others, even factoring in the harvesting, the processing, the transportation to deliver it, they actually are net storers of carbon. And we'll go into some detail on actual products that utilize these. One of the ones that's not on the list here, but I did want to talk about um, is wood fiberboard, which is a material that can be used as a thermal break um, building wrap uh, on structures. And it falls somewhere between the hempcrete and the straw bale metric on the carbon storing side of uh, the insulation equation. So definitely a tool that should be in your toolbox, uh, especially given the role it can play in reducing thermal bridging. So to look at some of the products available today in the cavity insulation area of building, uh, certainly cellulose, whether it's uh, you know, a sprayed or blown in um, method uh, is an obvious one, paper, wood pulp, uh, treated with typically borate for fire and insect resistance. We have sheep's wool, uh, Havelock Wool in Nevada is a company uh, distributing that. Um, and cotton, denim, and other um, cotton insulation materials available for many years now. Chopped straw is utilized in the UK as a cavity fill insulation. Um, rice hulls achieve a class A um, rating for insulation and can be used here in North America. And there is a, a loose fill version of wool uh, that can also be utilized as a cavity uh, fill. Some emerging and exciting uh, possibilities that are out there. Mycelium, uh, new frameworks actually uses mushroom insulation in some of their doors. Uh, and then root mat, just taking young plants, drying out, uh, and it's that little uh, pocket of air trapped in um, any type of insulation that creates that thermal resistance, um, you know, that's uh, important for an insulation product. Then we can look to the building wrap or sheathing pro, uh, possibilities. Um, cork is a renewable resource. As we know, cork grows on the bark of a tree. It can be harvested. The tree keeps living and it grows more cork. Um, also salvaged and recycled cork. They collect cork from wine bottles and make uh, products out of it. Compressed straw board, uh, stromit technology where the Straw is compressed with a little bit of heat. It releases the lignans in the material. Um, sided with paper, it creates a rigid board. And we'll see an example of uh, those being used as a wall system in a uh, portable tiny house. And then wood fiber board again. Uh, Gutex is one product that's available. There are some other companies out there here in North America making those. Um, worth noting that the um, binder is factored into the uh, carbon storing metrics here. So some have suggested that maybe the glues that holding these together completely negate the carbon storing properties. That is not true at all. They make up only 10% of the material. And the uh, builders for climate action metrics I shared earlier account for the binder in, in wood fiber board. Of course, uh, cladding and exterior finish materials, cork once again, um, wood in a whole variety of forms. Redwood is our uh, favorite exterior sheathing material here in Northern California. Nearly all of it is FSC grown. 
and 95% uh, of the forests um, are still standing and producing redwood today. And then uh, of course, bark. Um, North Carolina is a popular source for that. Some other products and systems to be aware of. Some of these are available. Some are you know, on the verge. Uh, stack block is a compressed straw uh, building block material. Looks and behaves like a big Lego. Um, Cal Plant One is a Northern California company that will be producing rice straw medium density fiberboard in the third quarter this year, or fourth quarter this year. And then finally, Fazwall and Duracell are brand names for a wood chip uh, insulating concrete form um, uh, foundation system. I want to look to a few other plant-based materials that you've no doubt uh, heard of, but uh, didn't realize how they were built, being built with. This is the the uh, beautiful work of Simone Velez, a Colombian architect, uh, but here in Northern California, Global uh, Bamboo Technologies creates a, a uh, wall panel system called BAMCOR, two structural skins that take both vertical and lateral loading with no studs. So it's in many ways a perfect wall and they've eliminated the thermal bridging of those studs and you can fill that cavity with uh, any insulation you like. Uh, so just another illustration of the BAMCOR system. Uh, hempcrete is uh, attracting uh, quite a buzz these days. It's using the starchy herd of the stalk of the hemp plant, chopping it up, mixing it with a lime binder, um, and then uh, using it typically in conjunction with wood framing to create a rammed earth-like substrate that's insulative, and you can then put a plaster finish upon it. Uh, Asheville, North Carolina is a hub of a lot of that type of work. Very similar um, using straw and a clay slip that the loose straw is mixed in and then once again compacted into formwork. Light straw clay popularized by um, the architect Paula Baker Laporte up in Oregon now and uh, once again a material that uh, ultimately creates an insulative substrate for plaster and other uh, stucco-like finishes. And there are, you know, many combinations of straw and clay. Adobe is a traditional one. Uh, Cobb goes back centuries in England. Um, basically, it's building with adobe while it's still wet and creating very thick walls with it. Um, want to reemphasize what Bruce was saying earlier about when you do use wood, use good wood. Um, salvaged and reused sources are one form of it. And new wood uh, FSC is uh, the, the go-to choice for that. And we're seeing amazing uh, development of larger um, wood products, cross-laminated timber, where smaller pieces of wood are laminated into giant pieces of plywood for floor decks and wall systems and tall timber using uh, those elements along with um, larger pieces of wood, some solid sawn, some engineered to create, um, you know, in this case, a nine story building, but they're going taller and taller all the time. And then finally, bringing some of these resources together to create panelized wall systems. Um, Endeavor Center does a prefab wall panel. Um, New Frameworks has done a project with them. ModCell is a UK company. Uh, it's been around for over a decade uh, with their panelized wall system. Um, a Lithuanian company, Eco Cocoon, that uses a timber frame and then packs loose straw into that as an insulative um, wall system, as well as a, a once again, a, a substrate for various types of wall finishes. And as Bruce alluded to early on, uh, straw bale as a means of um, insulating typically wood frame buildings, but not necessarily uh, by stacking them up. This uniquely American building system has been exported around the world like democracy and jazz. It is um, one of uh, the best things that's come out of America. And uh, these are some examples still standing today. Well, our organization, the California Straw Building Association has helped bring uh, straw bale into the building code. You can find Appendix S in the International Residential Code today. Um, I won't go into all the benefits of straw building, but here's a, a quick list of them and we'll jump to a few favorites. 
One is its um, thermal performance and the way that it also works is thermal mass. Uh, this green line you'll note is the middle of the wall and it is precisely the opposite of the higher outdoor um, and the lower indoor temperatures of a wall that was measured in the real goods building uh, that Bruce alluded to. Uh, fire tests, this is the Ecological Building Network um, and CASBA putting together fire tests that show that a lime plastered rice straw bale wall can achieve a two hour fire rating. And most significantly here, you'll note that uh, it took more than 30 minutes for that um, temperature and flame on the far side of the wall to even register on the near side. We want to also make mention of the remarkable fire resistive qualities of straw bale buildings. Um, th that wall assembly combined with other smart building techniques have created structures that have survived wildfires where a lot of neighboring buildings were lost. Uh, this is photographs from a client of ours watching his power structure burn from the safety of their straw bale home, which he and a neighbor were able to take shelter in and survive. Uh, the fire in 2017. Um, we've been involved in a number of fire rebuild projects. And in fact, with this one held a COVID era bail raising, bringing community together, uh, friends and family to uh, rebuild the structure that they lost. And uh, very excited uh, to see this Phoenix rising from the ashes. Um, and other examples, another one of ours from the 2017 fires uh, north of Sonoma that survived and many other examples of what you can do with straw bales. As our friend Mots Merman likes to say, um, you can do anything except have skinny walls. But with various products that are emerging, we expect that to be as well. But to the heart of this talk, why is this important? Um, it's because that annually renewable straw actually stores 1.62 pounds of carbon for every pound that's used in our buildings or with an average 2000 square foot home, 10 and a half tons of carbon dioxide uh, taken out of the atmosphere and stored away. Similarly impressive is the little TAM project from colleagues in the UK utilizing compressed straw as well as a loose straw fill. But note, it's a timber frame with timber cladding. So it's using all of the components of um, carbon storing materials to come together. Uh, an example of one of our projects uh, where we utilized straw in conjunction with um, traditional two by six wood framing at 24 inches on center, uh, fit the bales between those for insulation, utilized clay plaster harvested, um, half of it harvested at the building site itself as an interior wall finish for this building. And for the Walls themselves, um, 10 tons of CO2 storage versus what would have been 60 tons of CO2 emitted had we used a more typical system of steel studs, um, rigid insulation board, fiberglass insulation, and sheetrock on the interior. So tilting that scale in the direction of carbon storing. Um, I want to make mention of a few other uh, impressive projects. Uh, Chris Magwood's Zero House project um, with uh, 24 tons of CO2 storage. Uh, a prefab um, straw cell project by New Frameworks, 11 and a half tons of storage. Um, a teachers Union Office building, uh, 86 tons of storage. This is up in Ontario again. Um, probably the world's um, Biggest and best example, the Residence Jules Ferry in France, seven story housing project utilizing timber framing and CLT wall and floor decks in combination with uh, straw insulation panels. And you can see the wood and straw far uh, offsetting the emitted carbon of the concrete and steel in that example. And um, sort of taking the example Bruce gave of a podium type building, um, I'm working with Arup and Stop Waste, our local waste management authority to develop a carbon storing prototype here in the East Bay, uh, San Francisco Bay area and achieving 1100 metric tons of storage, which uh, is a, turning out to be a, a net um, CO2 um, emitted storage 
of 100 kilograms per meter squared. So again, simple three stories of residential over retail and office, um, standard double loaded corridor. So a very typical building and just showing that with the right material choices, we can begin the drawdown of carbon dioxide with our buildings. So I'll end with uh, some quick resources for you. If you wanna go deeper into straw, even though that's not the focus of our talk here, the uh, California Straw Building Association has a free download of the code with commentary on our website and you can order a book of details as well. So with that, I'll bring it back to our group here. And I think we've had a number of questions come up in the chat. Thanks, David. That was amazing. Um, when you and I talked earlier, I did comment that, you know, the straw bale rocks uh, from an environmental standpoint, it's scalability and, accessible and, uh, and accessibility to all people is a bit limited. Um, does that mean it's right? No, we should keep pushing. I buy that. But you know, you can only push so far and then that client walks. And so we're looking also not just at straw bale, but all these others. One of the questions that has mm -hmm. been asked is, uh, for instance, what are the price considerations for some of these? I'd like to address that. And you probably, David, get that question all the time on the front lines. Um, and most of these are more expensive processes than your code build stick home. I mean, they're just hard to get away from that. In our own company, for instance, our approach, we, we use Styco as an example. You mentioned Gutex. Styco is another brand name uh, mm -hmm. that's being imported aggressively into the states right now. And then there's others, Agripan and uh, others that aren't as aggressive in the states. But we just simply say, that's what we use. And it is a little more expensive, but you know, most clients are really not interested in the pennies. They are interested in a good builder to work with, a good team member. So earlier on, for instance, when we were practicing, so to speak, for this, Bruce King asked me, well, what am I going to present on? And you know, the main thing that's driven me for many years is running a good business. And I just want to say none of us can survive if we're struggling in bad business techniques and we don't have good coworkers and all of that. So along with all of these other knowledge skills, you also need to run a good business. Whether you're a one person architecture firm, a partner, a 130 person um, employee owned company like ours, uh, you really need to be good in business as well. And when you're really strong in business, then people come to you because you're gonna be a good partner in the work. And that means so much, that means more than you know, we give it credit for. People wanna be comfortable. And if you say, I build carbon efficiently, they're gonna often say, I'm so glad that you're with me on this. And so, you know, that's an important part too, when we think about the many tools that are available. I do wanna apologize, I had to move. I was sitting out by the pond earlier and I ran out of juice. So I had to move over by the motel door uh, where I could get some juice and the sun here is kind of bright. But uh, I think it's kind of indicative that the mo that the uh, pond didn't have electricity to it. I think that's a, a good social statement. Anyway, you need um, your, in, I'm going to wrap. Pardon? I was going to say you need your portable micro hydro unit down at the pond. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you know, um, just finishing up on that good business orientation, um, you've mentioned quite a few projects, David, that were completed by. Uh, New Frameworks as an example. And New Frameworks is a real core company to uh, involved in NASI, the New England, uh, sorry, Northeast Sustainable Energy Association that has a really good business building program because they believe that people like, you know, Ace and Jacob and all of their coworkers are doing incredible work, but they need to be a good business people to do that. So, you know, that's just another tool that needs to be addressed here. Um, I just wanted to comment on that. Let me see, I'm gonna look at these. These. Uh, how does wood fiber insulation compare to cellulose in environmental benefits around carbon? Well, maybe Bruce, we want to tackle that one? <laughs> no? 
So I've been using cellulose insulation since 1984. Holy Jonathan, you and David could probably each answer that better than I could. I know it, it doesn't have the same R value as plastic foam insulation, but um, I do want to say though about using cellulose and people, I think there's some questions coming in about the durability, how long will it stay there, uh, where you're really sequestering carbon. But here in uh, California and, I, and in Oregon as well, you're having the fires. And if you think about it at all, that smoke that you're smelling is not just forests and it's not just two by four studs, it's all the other junk that we put in our buildings. And here, climate considerations and uh, healthy home considerations, uh, red, red list chemicals and ILFI and so on, intersect with fire safety. Do we really want to keep building with weird chemicals that we really don't understand? And we certainly don't understand their health effects on us, especially when they burned and are in the air and then leave toxic ash on the whole area after the fires. The West is going to be burning for a while, folks. This isn't just a one-time shot flash in the pan. The long delayed forest fires that we've all been suppressing for decades are, are coming home and climate change is exacerbating that, which means that all the weird chemicals we've been using are not going to stay in half cans of mineral spirits in your garage. They're going to be in the air. That's not the answer to the question I think was asked, but too bad. That's the answer I'm giving yeah. you. But Nobody if, wants if to I talk could, more about If I could build on the original question, which was that of cost, um, because uh, it should be noted that in, in most jurisdictions, we're required to build to higher and higher thermal performance standards. So when you compare some of these options with you know, a two by four wall with fiberglass insulation, the two by four wall with fiberglass is always gonna win, but it's a substandard wall. So when we start to look at higher performance walls, bigger studs, exterior insulation wraps, et cetera. Um, other alternates, um, straw bale being one of them, start to look pretty good because you get a high, uh, similarly performing wall at a similar cost. With the Santa Rosa project, the fire rebuild I mentioned, the cellulose that's being blown into the ceiling cavities and the few walls that aren't straw bale, that cellulose bid was um, $21,000. The straw bales cost 2,600. So I think there are, you know, cost-saving um, opportunities with these natural alternatives, be they the fi wood fiber board and cellulose, be they straw or hemp or bamboo. They're starting to compete positively with what we think of as the more standard, and as Bruce just pointed out, far more toxic options. Yeah, well, well said. Um, you know, the, the, I'm in wine country up here, as is Bruce, and uh, many of the, the, the people are just not going to harvest their grapes this year, not going to make wine this year, you know, because not necessarily the smoke, but because of the toxicity within the smoke. And that is just, talk about environmental economic relationship of damage. Plus, six years from now, I'm not going to have my favorite wine. That's a problem. Tell you what. The other question though about uh, the cellulose, somebody's asking um, what about fires and fireproofing? You know, all of these things, all of these products are going through some pretty serious testing right now. Certainly the fire testing that's going on on the wood fired Gutex and Psycho for instance, is pretty extreme. So, you know, in cellulose itself, you can't get it to burn with a borax uh, base as a, uh, as a vermin and fire retardant. You just can't get it to burn. Now I'm a timber framer. I've been a timber framer for a whole lot of years. And some of many of my favorite pictures when this question comes up are of char the remains of a charred burned building where the posts and beams are still there with a carbon footing, with a, I'm sorry, with a carbon surface on them and a steel I-beam annealed folded over them all doing nothing but, you know, other than hurting people. So a lot of it, just because it's wood doesn't mean it's gonna burn. And of course, I'm sure many of you know about the work of the CLTs that have been going on. And the CLT industry is proving over and over again that a CLT building can withstand fire equal to or surpassing that of a concrete, uh, concrete and steel building for many of the reasons that we've said. So uh, just wanted to address those two questions really quick. 
I feel like, uh, Bruce, are you leaning into an answer in here or shall we go on? I am. Um, it's, it's ironic that this question comes up a lot and it seems natural. You know, what about, you know, wood fiber insulation, straw insulation, isn't it all going to burn? Well, you get it hot enough, yeah, it'll burn. Um, anything will burn if you get it hot enough and provide it with oxygen. But um, ironic because what we've become accustomed to is using uh, petroleum products for insulation. Fiberglass is pretty good, but these plastic foams, they burn. You may have heard of the Grenfell Towers fire in London three years ago, which killed a whole lot of people. A 20 story building and it was basically destroyed when a fire just went up the cavity that was badly designed for the skin of the building and the plastic foam insulation fed the fire um, and killed a lot of people. And now they're thinking, oh, oops, there's 120 buildings just like it all over England. I'm not sure what they're gonna do about it. Point being that there are some pretty nasty chemicals you can inject into things uh, to make them more fire resistant. And there's a whole sordid story about uh, this industry of fire retardants uh, getting them written into law and required in a lot of places where they weren't really needed and didn't really do much good. And they're highly, highly toxic stuff. Wood fiber insulation, yeah, it'll burn. If you, if you try hard enough, it'll burn. But man, I'd hold so much rather have that around me than plastic foam any day. And it won't burn any faster than the others, by the way. It has to pass the same test. So, uh, right, you add a little boring to like it, as Jonathan it. said, and it, it's very fire resistant. So basically, it's a non-issue as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I feel like it's I didn't answer uh, uh, David Shirley's uh, question about specifically wood fill, wood fiber fill insulation versus cellulose. Um, my own feeling is, is you can't be cellulose. You know, if you look at all the carbon and in, involved, you know, carbon implant, uh, sorry, carbon um, footprint measurements, you know, the R value per amount of cellulose is hard to beat. Maybe other than straw, David, uh, it's not my area, but maybe other than that. When it comes to the, you know, the carbon footprint, uh, it's just hard to beat chewing up old newspaper. But uh, the wood fiber is coming on strong. All of these strategies will be better if people like us, meaning all of you people who are watching this, are pushing for it and the, and uh, plants become more spread out. Uh, Europeans invest in the U.S., uh, which they're not doing right now because political situation and yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, if we can push for these specific strategies, and those prices will come down, you know. So, but people like us have to do that. Uh, David, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Did you, did you... I, do, I just want to build on that, and I think the um, the the answer that I would give to that cellulose versus wood fiber board question is, what are you trying to do, and which is more appropriate in that given situation? You know, if you're looking to move the dew point out of, you know, the cavity, then wrapping with wood fiber board is a great way to do that. Um, you know, if you're looking to fill up a large cavity and achieve, you know, a high insulation value, cellulose is probably the best choice. And I think that the truth of the matter is these are all tools that should be in your toolbox, but, you know, you need to learn which tool to use in any given situation. Um, you know, for a lot of our projects, we will do a woofy analysis, which is looking at the moisture drive within the wall and where those, you know, weak points might be and making sure that we're not setting up a situation where, where a cellulose based material is likely to fail. So applying building science with these choices is really key. I'm going to jump in because the, the question most often asked has come up about, about mold. It's a good question. Andrew Burke has Aren't you asked. worried about mold? Sure. You should always be worried about mold if you're in the building business because mold is everywhere. They're, they found mold spores in the space station. Mold doesn't need much to grow. And yes, cellulose will provide it more. We have a rich history of that because we've been building with wood for centuries. The way you deal with mold is design and build well. And the way you get mold is to not design and build well. Kind of doesn't matter what the material is. Concrete will get funky if you give it a chance. So um, yeah, sure, we worry about mold. And we, we in, the, in the straw bale movement of the last 25 years 
uh, and more broadly the natural building movement um, have had the benefit because the, le the now legendary rock star building scientist John Straub uh, joined in the fun way back then in the dawn of email and the internet and the straw bale movement. And so we had the benefit of first class building science advice and we learned a lot from him and we all became much more aware and all of our writings and all of our books that we've referenced here have John Straub behind them because he he drilled some basic stuff into us we understood like don't let the water get in and then allow for the fact that it will get in anyway and give it a way to dry out real simple things that apply to any building project so yeah we worry about mold and we deal with it next question yeah and I mean if you don't so so the problem with our industry is you have to be incredibly smart if you're standalone or be part of a good team. I recommend the latter. I often say the hundred of us make a pretty good carpenter. You know, it takes a lot of people to really build this stuff, but, it's, but you have to understand building science for sure. There is a question here that is fascinating to me is paint better than stain and which is which. And, you know, for me, I think these are small things to be honest with you. And I don't, Andrew, I don't mean to, you know, uh, uh, minimize that. I mean, the specific answer to your question is paint the hell out of any piece of wood you want to last. The more you can coat it, the better. You know, I've actually taken apart uh, 200 year old buildings when I lived in New York and uh, underneath the outside cove molding was air. The paint had just say, you know, just the paint was so thick that it was, you know, supporting everything under there, including nothing. So paint it like crazy. But the, but the reality is, you know, um, these days the coatings are so strong and so good that it is important, in my opinion, to coat what you can coat. Coat it any way you want, but they're all pretty darn good. Just let be coating. You know, that's an opinion only after doing it for 30 or 40 years. People say, how do I keep my wood looking like fresh cedar? I say stain it the color of fresh cedar. <clears throat> Otherwise, just enjoy the gray. Hey, what other questions are there here? We're running out of time a little bit. One comment I'd make, I'd make is I'm fascinated by the fact that we're all doing this with no carbon footprint about getting together. I, at, at, in some ways I love this and in some ways I hate it, but no, nonetheless, I mean, I'm riding across America right now on a motorcycle and I'm in a motel somewhere and nowhere is the, actually it's a really cool place. And here we are together. I just wanted to comment on that as we come to the end of our hour. A uh, few minutes left. I'm looking at at uh, questions. David or Bruce, how are you doing? Zoning setbacks and taxes. Oh my uh, yeah, there were a couple comments about the um, thickness of some of these building systems in order to achieve the R value that's comparable to. Um, foam or uh, other rigid insulation products. And it's true, um, you know, straw for an example has an R2 per inch um, when it's used on edge and R1.2 when laid flat where the, you know, straw is a conduit um, for heat transfer. So you need more of it. Um, conveniently, it comes packaged that way. It may not be the right tool in the toolbox in some situations, but on a lot of, you know, larger rural sites or other opportunities um, where you can take advantage of that thickness and actually occupy a window seat or something like that. You know, there's some aesthetic values that offset what you might lose in a little bit of square footage. So um, there are always trade-offs in buildings as we all know, and it's just choosing Coming the ones that have the best benefit. Thanks. Coming back to an earlier comment from Bruce, he says, buy the book, give it to your friends. I just wanna say I'm on my third case of Bruce's books. I literally give them to people who visit us and they think I'm nuts, but when you buy it by the case, it's incredibly affordable. It's less than taking them out for coffee at a fancy coffee place with pastry. You give them that book and they look at you like you're nuts, but you've really passed on a whole bunch of information. <laughs> I don't know, Bruce, if you even know that I do that, but it's, uh, it's really fun and people really appreciate it. It's an easy reading book. There's a lot of good information. It's not just all about straw bale. It's also about many other areas of uh, how you can lower 
your carbon, I mean, how you can sequester carbon, lower your carbon equivalencies. It taught me a lot about the language. I'm more comfortable talking to my clients about it. Um, so anyway, that's a comment that I wanted to come up with a little later. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jonathan. I'm glad, glad you liked it. I, I should add, Good. Great. It's, it's, the book is dedicated to women uh, it, for a lot of reasons, which I explain in the book. But uh, here's, a, here's a giveaway from Paul Hawkins' book, Drawdown, which Paul loves to talk about when he talks about it, that when he looked at the 100 best solutions for getting carbon out of the air, there were a lot of surprises. The number, if I told you the number one one, you would never have guessed it. You know? It's related to our industry, related to our talk today. But he said, if you take the number three and the number five considerations, and this was like hundreds of scientists and students all over the world working on this and researching and trying to stay agnostic and not push any preference or agenda. He said, the number, I think it was the number three and the number five, if you combine them together, they were far bigger than anything else. And those were educating girls and giving women the rights over their bodies. It's all about you, women. That's how we're going to save the climate, educating girls and giving women their rights so that you're not forced to have 10 or 12 children that you didn't want to have and you only have two. That's where they, I have, I say this because I, I just, it just moves me and I have to remind myself that that's really where the lever is. That's where the action is. Besides that it's kind of humane, um, that's where the action is. Well, and Bruce, I'm going to jump in and mention the number one, which you didn't, uh, which is um, eliminating um, refrigerants that are leaking into the atmosphere, uh, controlling that. And refrigerants are most typically found in heat pump uh, air conditioning units, which as the climate warms, more and more people want to cool with uh, air conditioning. And I, I want to tie that back to this conversation in that the proper design of buildings using materials that have thermal resistance and you know high um, thermal mass performance can reduce or eliminate the need for air conditioning. And the vast majority of our projects, even those in hot climates, don't need air conditioning. My home doesn't have air conditioning, and it's designed. I have the what I call the 11 step program to give up air conditioning and it, these things work I mean if you design it right and if you think it right and if occasionally you're not afraid to sweat then you know those things work hey there's another question on here uh, uh, Bill Smith he says oh goodness it's a lob he says what is new energy work using to do this net zero and and what are we doing well not enough. Bottom line, not enough. I mean, but the things we are doing is, you know, my own house sits on uh, fast wall blocks. Those are those wood, wood pallet ICFs. The walls are cellulose. And then, uh, and what we're doing now is all of our thermal bridging, so, so important, is done with uh, European style wood, wood, rigid wood fiber, in our case, Stico. Uh, and, um, uh, David mentioned Gutex, uh, both of which are valid options. Um, but uh, you know, we do we go through everything and work hard to look at the ramifications of what we do. Uh, but we never do enough. And Lord knows, we build big houses. Not always, thank goodness. My favorite last year was an 1,100 square foot house uh, that is net zero. Um, but but we build some big houses. You know, we make a living doing it. And do we try to convince people that maybe they need a few thousand square foot less or a few hundred square foot less or 20% or less every time? And we're pretty successful. Uh, that's what we all as designers, as professional designers need to do. We need to do everything we can while still running a good business and staying in touch with the environmental edge, which these two folks have done really brilliantly together. Uh, so I think we're coming towards probably Pat, right? Knowing me, uh, knowing us. About anyway, five, any yeah. last words, Bruce and, Bruce and David? Any last words? Keep up the good work, everybody. And keep, your, fine. keep your heart. Stay sane and kind in these days to come. Nothing could be more Lord important. Almighty. Build shelter, not too big, mostly plants. God, I love that. I am so going to borrow that. <laughs> Please do. 
All right. Thanks, everybody. We're gone. Thanks.